acontecer. Ok, um, wait, let me see. Share the screen. Are you, are you able to see the slideshow? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hadwaita Gadatar, Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our Bhakti Vaibhav. We're on Canto 2 and we're studying today chapter number... So, in the previous chapters we heard, first of all, chapter 1, we heard about worshipping the Lord in the impersonal form, the universal form. And then the second chapter we heard about understanding the Lord through Paramatma. And then in the third chapter, we heard that we can worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead as a person even though we have material, even though we have material desires or we're pure devotees or we desire liberation, whatever reason we have we can worship the Supreme Lord. So in this way Sutta Goswami was encouraging Maharaj Parikshit to engage himself fully in remembering the Supreme Lord. And after that, then we heard Shonakarishi glorify the hearing process. Right? So Shonakarishi was speaking, and that was coming, going back to the sages in Naimisharanya, and Shonakarishi was describing how people who don't hear, how they're really condemned. Right? We heard about their ear holes are like the holes of a snake and their tongues are like the croaking of the frog, all of these things. If they don't use their legs to go to the temple, then the legs are like the stumps of a tree stuck in the ground. And so Shona Karishi was describing his, the, the eagerness which uh, devotees should have, how they should be very very enthusiastic and eager to hear about Krishna. So, Maharaj Parikshit, the son of Uttara, after hearing the speeches of Srila Sukadeva Goswami, which were all about the truth of the Self, applied his concentration faithfully upon Lord Krishna. So that's the first verse, and in that first verse, uh, the Maharaj Parikshit is described as being a satim, satim meaning chaste, that he was chaste to, his mind was chaste to the thought of Lord Krishna. He was very faithful. And Srila Prabhupada in the purport mentions about two things which are very important 
for someone to have that kind of chastity, to make his mind very chaste, two things are very helpful. One is, they should be born in a family of devotees. So Maharaj Parikshit had that advantage, that he was born, of course, in the family of the Pandavas, the grandson of Arjuna, the son of Abhimanu. So he was born in the family of great devotees. And the second thing is, what, what, who knows, what's the second thing? Blessings of a bona fide spiritual master. Right, the blessings of a bona fide spiritual master. So Maharaj Parikshit was really very fortunate that at the moment, at the end, when, uh, with the, his cursing, that Sukadeva Goswami had appeared to give his blessings and to, to guide Maharaj Parikshit in his preparation for leaving the world. It makes me think about his Holiness Kadamba Kanna Swami Maharaj, who's uh, preparing himself also for his imminent departure. And he's also there in the association of his spiritual master. Jayadvaita Swami is there with him, guiding him and encouraging him, keeping him in consciousness of Krishna. Association, very important. And we know also Madhavendra Puri. Madhavendra Puri, at the end of his life, he was blessed with the association of Ishwara Puri. Ishwara Puri was his disciple, and Ishwara Puri was faithfully serving him. Similarly, Srila Prabhupada, at the end of his life, he was calling the devotees. He was called the devotee, everyone come. He didn't care who, he just called everyone, you, you can come, come and be with me. And Prabhupada liked to hear the devotees, he liked reports from the devotees about their preaching, and he liked to hear the devotees do kirtan, and in this way Prabhupada enjoyed the association of his devotees, his disciples. All right, uh, now, let's see, what's the next slide? So Sutta Goswami continues the narration. Maharaj, oh, this is from the first verse. Maharaj Parikshit, the son of Uttara, after hearing the speeches of Srila Sukadeva Goswami, which were all about the truth of the Self, applied his concentration faithfully upon Lord Krishna. So, we mentioned about Maharaj Parikshit's faithfulness, his chaste mind, faith, very important. You have to have firm faith. Your faith must be strong. We have to get firm. If we don't have firm faith, you have to develop firm faith. You have to develop it by hearing from a bona fide spiritual master. Or you may have been fortunate enough to be born in a family of devotees. From the beginning of life, you have that opportunity. Then it becomes natural. So Maharaj Parikshit, because of his devotion to Lord Krishna, when the curse came upon him, he accepted it and he gave up everything. He gave up all of the attachments which we have. He gave up all of his attachments. Prabhupada talks about the attachment to horses and elephants and maybe you have a big herd of cows, and so on, you could become attached to these things. Prabhupada mentions how in the modern time, people, they don't have horses so much, 
or elephants, but what, what they do have is cars. They have their automobiles, and we're very attached to cars. You know, in the material world, people are very attached to these things, motor cars. Of course, they cost so much money. You spend so much money to hire, to buy a car, then you have to maintain it, and you have to look after it. You have to get new tires all the time. You have to constantly check the balancing of the tires. You have to service the engine. The people will clean the car and polish the car. And so Prabhupada used to speak about that, how if somebody was driving and somehow they, some, maybe there was an accident, then the person would jump out of the car and say, you hit me. You hit me. So Prabhupada was pointing out how people identify with the body and they identify also with the vehicle. Prabhupada would talk about how the person in the ambassador car would blow the, he would be blowing his horn on the car and saying, get out of my way rickshaw. Rickshaw, get out of my way. This is ambassador. I am ambassador. Get out of the way. Like this, we become very attached to these things. We identify with these things. And nowadays, of course, we have things like computers and mobile phones. And we're very attached to these things. But at the time of death, you have to give up all of these things. We have to give up any kind of attachment. And we saw Srila Prabhupada do that before he left the world. He gave everything away. He gave his watch away. He, he gave rings away which he was wearing, which he had on his finger. He gave the one ring to, to, I think George Harrison was to be given one ring. Like that. So, Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, he said, I came to the world with nothing, I want to leave it with nothing. We don't want to be attached. So Maharaj Parikshit, he was able to give up all kinds of karmakandi activities, he stopped performing all kinds of rituals, he didn't worry about anything except fixing his mind on Krishna. So being able to do that was possible by Maharaj Parikshit because he was a devotee, because he'd been devoted to Krishna, because he'd had that upbringing and he practiced throughout his life. So at the time of death it was not a problem for him. Now if one is not so accustomed to that, then what should you do? What should you do if you're not a devotee and the time of death is coming? What should you do? Any suggestions? Yes? Um, we should surround ourselves with the association of devotees. We are ourselves not that. If you're not a devotee, do you think you're going to be able to get the association of devotees at the end of life? I mean, I think you'd be very, you may be lucky, but I don't know. Hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj, so uh, many of the uh, uh, family, the tradition is that once you turn this 70 or something like that, you give away all your uh, properties, everything, and have a minimum uh, uh, things to stay, so that there should not be any further litigations when you leave this world. So that is where mostly it is being followed in materialist. Otherwise, it creates a lot of problem when you leave. So have you what done? Have, have you done that yet? I'm not yet turned seventy, Maharaj. Are you preparing for that? I uh, mostly I have done that. Okay. Yes, we have to we have to give up all this. Th we have to prepare to give up. We should they should give away everything. Get 
get free from all the attachments. And you have to also get away from the, 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 the family, actually. You don't want to be surrounded by women at the end of life. Generally, when the person is leaving the world, like Srila Prabhupada, we didn't have women ever come in this room. It was always just men. You don't want to be seeing women at the end of life. So that kind of renunciation is required. All right, so the first four verses describe uh, Maharaj Parikshit accepted the instructions of Sukadeva Goswami and fixed his mind on Krishna. Of course, he was a devotee, he'd been thinking of Krishna. Remember, as a child in the womb, he had the, he'd been saved by Lord Krishna. So he got the name Parikshit, meaning examiner, because he was constantly looking to see again that wonderful form which he had seen when he was within the womb of the mother. So the first four verses, Maharaj Parikshit is accepting the instructions of Sukadeva Goswami and he's questioning. He wants, he has inquiries, right? So that comes, takes five to ten. Maharaj Parikshit inquires about Shristi Tattva, about the, the process of creation, the subject matter of this chapter, Shristi Tattva. He's not asking immediately, tell me about Krishna and the gopis. Let me hear Rasa Lila. But he's, he wants to know about Shristi Tattva. And then the rest of the chapter, we will hear Sukadeva Goswami's prayers which are uh, recited by Srila Prabhupada. There's a recording, Srila Prabhupada chants Sukadev Goswami's prayers. If you have the Prabhupada folio, you can hear Prabhupada reciting all the prayers from this chapter, with um, at least Sukadev Goswami's prayers from this chapter. Each of the verses Prabhupada chants them sing some. Okay, so inspired by Shonakarishi's eagerness, Sutta, Sutta Goswami continues the narration from the previous chapter. Shonakarishi so, was eager. He talked about how, how we have to be eager to hear and now Sutta Goswami is continuing. So he applies his concentration faithfully upon Krishna. This, a, a quote from the fifth verse of the fourth chapter. The great test the crucial test. When a hungry man is given food to eat, he feels satiation of hunger and the pleasure of dining simultaneously. Thus he does not have to ask whether he has actually been fed or not. The crucial test of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is that one should get positive enlightenment by such an act. Uh, you can see this statement of Srila Prabhupada from the Purpur. It's like a paraphrase of a well-known verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, right? Do you know that verse? But where you can, where eating food, then you give up your hunger. As you go on eating, 
you feel satiation of hunger and you take pleasure in eating. In the same way, when we practice devotional service, in the course of our devotional service, we should develop devotion and detachment from the material world. These things should come simultaneously as we go on in the practice of devotional service. Right? Bhakti Parishanubhavo Viratya and Yatra Chaisa Traika Kala. Like that. This is the, the verse. Prabhupada's of Prabhupada's purports are often like that. He will take a a statement, another verse, and he would just paraphrase it. So Prabhupada said, this is a test of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, that we should get positive enlightenment by such an act. Just like we were in the last class, you may remember we spoke about the change in heart, the change in heart, that we should actually feel an awakening, a change. And so similarly hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, it should work in a similar manner to the chanting of the holy name, that we should get that positive enlightenment. We become more attached to Krishna. An attachment to Krishna means detachment from the material world. So Maharaj Pariksit was a nice example of this. He was fully absorbed in hearing about Krishna. He was not eating. You know, often you give a class in the morning and people are always, what time is prasadam? <laughs> They're always thinking, I wonder what, I wonder what for prasadam this morning, you know. You're trying to give a Bhagavatam class, but people are just simply sit, sitting and thinking, what am, what am I going to have for my breakfast? They're not much focused on hearing. Of course, today's a kadasi, and so it's a good day for people to be more focused on hearing, less attention to eating and more concentration on hearing and chanting. So Maharaj Parikshit was fully, fully absorbed in that way. And Prabhupada in his purport, he talks about Maharaj Yudhisthira, that Maharaj Yudhisthira is a wonderful example, that he used everything for the service of Krishna. He didn't, you don't have to give up everything if you're... Sorry, somebody calling me. Uh, you don't have to give up material things if they're being used in the service of Krishna. If you're attached to them for your sense gratification, then you should give them up. But if you're actually positive about them, that it's all for the service of Krishna, then you don't have to give them up. So we try to practice Krishna consciousness in that manner. Nirbandha Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchate. That actual renunciation is in relation to Krishna. We don't have to give up what is useful for our service to Krishna. But we do have to be careful. We become too attached to material things, material opulence, position, and so many things of the material world can influence us. So. Prabhupada writes about, in the Nectar of Devotion, he writes about one man, Lal Baba. He was a businessman in Calcutta. 
and he gave up everything. And he went and lived in Vrindavan and he would go and beg from people who were more or less like his enemies. So, in, the, in this way, he was cultivating humility, a great test. We're talking here about the crucial test. And we have to, we have to develop that, uh, that detachment from the false ego, the detachment from the material things. So hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, we can understand how well we're hearing it by how we get enlightenment. Okay, we'll go ahead. So here's Maharaj Pariksit's questions. He's inquiring from the Lord. First of all, how does the Lord create the universe? which are inconceivable even for the demigods. One point which Prabhupada notes in the purport from this is that at least Maharaj Parikshit, of course Maharaj Parikshit, he knows these things, but he wants to hear. He wants to hear from Sukadeva Goswami. So he has put this question to Sukadeva Goswami, but he he knows these things, he's a pure devotee himself, but by the arrangement of the Lord, he's in this position, he's preparing for death, and he's teaching all of us how we have to understand everything about the Lord. So his first question is, how does the Lord create the universes? So Prabhupada notes that common man they think the universe just came about automatically. They don't believe there's a creation. They won't, they won't accept that there's a creator, that there's an intelligent personality behind the universe. They never, they never even consider how did it all come about. But Maharaj Parikshit, he, he's, he's asking, how does the Lord create the universes? So he understands there is a person, there is a creation, there's a process of creation. And it is not just chance. Prabhupada said chance, that is a, only for fools. There's no such thing as chance anywhere in the world, in the creation. Okay, second point. How does the Lord engage his energies and expansions in the maintenance and destruction of the universes? Maharaj Parikshit wants to understand about the different energies of the Lord as well as his expansions. Uh, why would Maharaj Parikshit ask these kind of questions? What would be the reason for it? Would somebody like to tell me? Put your hand up if you know. Why, the, why Maharaj Parikshit is asking these questions? Diti Gopi, Juti Gopi. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, I just think that uh, he, as you mentioned previously, you were mentioning that he didn't directly want to jump on the 10th canto. That explained me about the relationship of Krishna with Gopis. He wanted to understand how it came into existence and, you know, every inquisitive mind, it starts, it's, it always wants to decode about how creation and it's all activities related to Krishna. So that's why he first wanted to know what creation and then dive into different rasas. Yeah, but I would like to know why. 
Why you would want to know about creation? Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay, right. Oh, ask somebody else. What about who's this? Uh, mm. Diksha Ahuja. Maharaj, uh, I, as per my understanding, uh, in the previous chapter, Virat Roop was discussed. So after that, these inquiries are coming. So um, one point could be this that uh, Maharaj Parishad wants to know. And second point, I could understand like Krishna mentions in Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Cha So uh, he wants to know the activities of the Lord so that uh, he can go back to God. Mm -hmm. Yes, he wants to know, but there are so many activities of the Lord. Why he particularly asks about creation? That's my question. Uh, maybe we'll ask this. Uh, uh, Who is this? Uh, oh, Chitta Hari Krishna. Chitta Hari Krishna. Yes, Chitta Hari. Prabhu. Hare Krishna, yes Maharaj, yes. audible? Yes Prabhu, now I can hear you, yeah. I was thinking that uh, here, uh, because uh, people know that God is great, but they don't know how great He is. And that's why they equate Him with their gods and they cannot... Right? First, before entering into internal energy of Krishna or His transcendent pastimes, they should understand how this extra energy is working in this material world. He is control of that. So how great he is, that if that understanding they approach this in past times, they will be able to appreciate it better. That's why it is explained here, creation aspect. Uh-huh. Yeah, there yeah, we should know how great now how great is he though. Yes, yeah, it's, it's true, we should know how great he is. But we we have to understand particularly uh, how great he is, as you say. And how great is he? Do you know Rati Prada? Is it Rati Prada? Radha? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Maharaj, Krishna. My answer was similar to Prabhuji, uh, that he wanted to establish the uh, supreme position of the Lord uh, by asking the questions on creation so that everybody who reads um, may know the exact position of the Lord that he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and then he will, he will, he should be able to understand the tenth canto. Okay. Otherwise he might consider Krishna as an ordinary boy. Right, yes, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, good. Okay, let's hear Nimai or oh, Nilima, Nilima. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tendo. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Parishit Maharaj is uh, knowing Krishna from before his birth. Like he is remembering Krishna um, when he is in uh, his mother's uh, womb. So he is remembering, uh, Parishit Maharaj was remembering Krishna as that small uh, Rupa. So he he wants to, wanted to know in detail that uh, about the Krishna, everything he wanted to know. Okay, yes, he wanted to know everything about Krishna. I, but the, what, he, he, what he really wants to bring out is the fact that Lord Krishna has inconceivable potencies. Hearing, as, as it's mentioned here, that even the demigods cannot, under, it's inconceivable to the demigods how the Lord creates the universe. So this, this is the power of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that he has this achincha shakti, inconceivable powers. And also, another reason why he wants to bring out this point, that the, the Lord is inconceivably powerful, because he could understand that in the future, particularly in the Kali Yuga, there will be many impostors who are claiming to be the Supreme Lord who are claiming, who want to take the position of the Lord and claim themselves as an avatar 
or, or is the, the original Lord Himself. So He wants to establish that if somebody is actually the Lord, if He's really the Supreme Lord, then He should have these inconceivable powers. And He should be able to do such things as create entire universes. So this is why Sukhita Maharaj Parikshit is asking this kind of question. He wants to bring, because later on, of course later on, Sukadeva Goswami is going to go on to describe about the Lord and his, the pastimes of his internal potency. The pastimes of creation are all the external potency of the Lord. But the internal potency, that will be described later on in the tenth canto. And in order to understand the pastimes of the Lord and His internal potency, one first of all has to understand His inconceivable potency. That He does have this incredible, in, just powers far beyond anything we can even begin to understand. And then you can go on to understand Krishna's pastimes. But without understanding the Lord's pastimes, we think of him like an ordinary person, and we think, then people will think they can imitate the Lord. So in the very beginning, Sukadeva Maharaj Pariksha is bringing out this point that we want to, he wants all of us, and we want, he wants to hear from Sukadeva Goswami, how the Lord actually does this business of creation. Okay, and then third question, does the Lord directly deal with the modes of nature or He acts through His expansions? So I was talking about the Lord's internal and external potencies. To give, Prabhupada gives an example about the king, he may have affairs in governing the state. You know, he'll go into his court and he'll uh, give orders about what should be done in the kingdom and how to take care of different problems in the kingdom. But the internal potency would be like, what goes on in the king's palace? What are the affairs of the king, for example, with his wives and so on? You, you know, you're not going to hear about the, what, what happens with the king with his wives, you know, how he's getting along with his wives. Are they all cooperating with each other and are they love, faithful to the king? All of the affairs of the king with his wives and family members that's the internal potency. The external potency is how the king deals with the kingdom. And so the, the king's affairs are private. And so similarly, the Lord's pastimes are private. They're, they come later on in the tenth canto. After one has first of all heard about the Lord's different potencies, how he does the work of creation, and how he arranges everything and how there's so many expansions and so many avatars and so many different uh, functions which the Lord is doing, which the Lord is overseeing in the external potency. So we first have to understand that. And as we hear these things, then we become more and more devoted. We hear about the Lord and His inconceivable powers, and this way we become more devoted to Him. And then we become more qualified to understand the affairs of the internal potency. Right? Can somebody read this? Krishna's relationship with the material energy. Someone read? An inexperienced boy may be struck with wonder by seeing the impersonal actions of electronics 
or many other wonderful things conducted by electrical energy. But an, but an experienced man knows that behind the action is a living man who creates such energy. Yes, wait, who's there? Let me see, is there another? Wait, go ahead. Yeah. Similarly, the so-called scholars and philosophers of the world may, by mental speculation, present so many utopian theories about the impersonal creation of the universe. But an intelligent devotee of the Lord, by reading the Bhagavad Gita, can know that behind the creation is the hand of the Supreme Lord. Just as in the generating electrical powerhouse, there is the resident engineer. Okay, yes. Prabhupada is giving the simple example that electricity it, it, it's coming from the power station. There's a power station from where the electricity comes. We, it's, the in, unintelligent person puts a plug in, plugs into the power supply without understanding that the the connection is being made to the power station. And in the power station there are engineers and they're arranging for the generation of the electricity. So in the same way, common people, they look at the material world and they cannot understand that there must be some creator behind everything. They're thinking, sometimes they they give different theories, atheistic theories about how life came about. We have the Big Bang Theory or everything came from the white hole or everything. Life is the, 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 the theory of evolution and so many different theories, all speculations by atheistic people who have no common sense to understand there must be some intelligent personalities behind the world who are arranging for all of this. So the example is very important that just like electricity comes from the powerhouse. And so the material energy is coming from the Supreme Lord. It is the external potency of the Lord. And that external potency is under the direction of the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita, what is Krishna, how does Krishna describe the material energy being under the control of the Lord? What's a verse? Yes, right. That's a verse, right. So material nature is moving under my direction, O son of Kunti. So it's not independent, there's some control there. All right, someone read, please. The conclusion is, therefore, that a serious devotee must first approach a spiritual master who is not only well versed in the Vedic literatures, but is also a great devotee with factual realization of the Lord and his different energy. A bona fide spiritual master like Shukadev Goswami does not speak about the Lord only in the matter of his internal potencies, but also explains how he associates with his external potencies. Yes, wait, keep reading. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti offers his good counsel to the interested Vaishnavas when he says that he should not be when he says that they should not be interested in hearing only about the lord's activities like rasalila but must be keenly interested in his pastimes in his features of purusha avatar in the connection with shrishti tattva creational functions following the examples of maharaj parikshit the ideal disciple and the shukdev and shukdev goswami the ideal spiritual master shrin bhagavatam 2.4.10 Thank you. Yes, it said on one occasion, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur Prabhupada uh, went to Radhakund and he was to give a lecture to all the Babajis. So all the many Babajis, they came to hear his lecture. 
But when Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur began to speak about the external potency, about the affairs of creation, and he began to speak from the Upanishads and so on, then the, the Babajis, many of them, they just got up and left because they, they didn't want to hear. They thought they were so advanced that they didn't need to hear these things. They just wanted to hear Leelas, they just wanted to hear about the Lord's pastimes with the gopis and so on. So they didn't like to hear the issue from the Upanishads. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati could understand that these kind of people, they're actually neophyte devotees. They could not appreciate that the external potencies of the Lord are also the pastimes of the Lord. So it's important for everyone to understand this whole process of creation and how the Lord's different energies are functioning, particularly how the Lord in His feature as the Purusha avatars is arranging for this whole creation. So Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur himself is a great devotee and he talks about Rasalila, but he doesn't just only talk about Rasalila. That comes after you've studied all the preliminary things. So we have to impress this on people, they have to hear the basic knowledge. Don't just jump to the intimate pastimes of the Lord but hear about his affairs with the material energy. All right? Yes, someone can read here. Sruta Goswami said, when Shukadev Goswami was thus requested by the king to destroy the creative energy of the personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered the master of the senses, Sri Krishna, and to reply properly, he spoke thus. Right. So, Sutta Goswami uh, describing how Sukadeva Goswami was requested to describe this creative energy of the Lord. So, it's such a daunting topic. You know, someone asks you to speak on such a thing, and certainly Sukadeva Goswami cannot just simply say, Oh no, I don't want to speak on this, I just want to speak on gopis. Sukadeva Goswami is obliged to reply, to answer the question of Maharaj Pariksit. And remember, there's an assembly of other people there also. There's so many others there. So they will all be benefited by hearing the pastimes of the Lord. Not only just simply the internal pastimes, but the external potencies in relation to the creation. So Sutta Gos Sukadev Goswami has been asked to describe this. So. How does he respond? He immediately uh, prays to the Lord to empower him that he can speak appropriately. And that's why he offers his prayers. Just like before we speak Srimad Bhagavatam in the morning, or maybe you're speaking Bhagavad Gita, maybe you're asked to give a Bhagavad Gita class. So generally the procedure is that before we begin to speak, we will first of all recite prayers. We will recite our Guru Pranam Mantra, and maybe we may also recite Umma Jnana and Bandi Ham. These different prayers may be recited. I know uh, His Holiness Gorgovinda Swami Maharaj, when he would give a class, he would begin 
reciting verses for 10-15 minutes before he would begin the class. He would like to take blessings by remembering the potency of the Lord. Srila Jadpataka Swami Maharaj, he has one prayer which he likes to recite. Are any of you disciples of Jadpataka Swami Maharaj? Anybody there? No? Anyway, he... Yes? Okay, do you know the verse, Ma Mati, uh, Prabhu? Is it Matiji? Do you know the verse? Welcome Karoti. Yes, right, that verse. Go ahead. Karoti Vajal, Pangum Langai Tegiran, Tadkripa Tamaham Bande, Sri Guru Dinakarini. Sri Chaitanya Ishvaram. Mm -hmm. Parmanam Madhana. What's the meaning? Do you know? By the mercy of the Guru, even a um, person who cannot speak, uh, 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 he can speak, and a person who is a lame, he can walk the mountains. Yes, by the mercy of spiritual master, or a lame man can cross mountains, a dumb man can recite poetry, a blind man can see the stars. By the mercy of the spiritual master. Like that. You know, every devotee will have their own particular prayers which they like to recite before giving the class. Right? I assume you've all, you're all giving classes sometimes. Right? Are you giving classes sometimes, Rati Prada? Yes, Maharaj, sometimes. Yes. So what, do you recite these prayers when you give a class? Maharaj, I recite the Mangala Charan, which is um, in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, all those prayers. Yes, that's right. That's common, the prayers which are there in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Okay. What about Padmarada? But Marada was there, she disappeared. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? Yes, Maharaj, you have a question? Is it? D Diksha, Maharaj, you have a Hi. question? Yes, Maharaj, I have a question that uh, while you were explaining that uh, why Parikshit Maharaj asked the question regarding the creation, Maharaj, uh, I could not grasp it so much. Uh, can you please repeat that point that why Parikshit Maharaj asked such question regarding the creation and regarding the energies of the Lord? Yes, okay. There were two reasons I gave. One reason was that he wants to impress on everyone, as well as himself, that the Lord has inconceivable potencies, achintya shakti. His potencies are inconceivable. It's very important to understand the pastimes of the Lord that we have to accept that there are such things as inconceivable potencies, powers which are beyond our comprehension. We give the example, just like the sun produces so much energy in the form of heat and light, and somehow it's never exhausted. We have a fire we have to continually put fuel onto the fire to get the heat and light. But every day, constantly, the sun is emitting inconceivable amounts of heat and light. And with 
over thousands and millions of years, the sun is continuing to give us that heat and light and warmth, which make life bearable. Now, without the light of the heat, without the heat and light of the sun, life would be unbearable. The whole universe would be dark and we'd be freezing. So there are such things in the, in the world as inconceivable potencies. We're not really aware of these things. We just take everything for granted. Oh, it's just there. Oh, you know, don't, people say, don't ask, just accept, just take advantage. Why try to, why asking so many questions? We're discouraged from being inquisitive. But Maharaj Parikshit wants to understand by hearing about the process of creation through the different Purusha avatars, you can understand more of the inconceivable potencies of the Supreme Lord. And the second reason I gave was that the Lord, uh, uh, Maharaj Parikshit wants to show that the Supreme Lord, that if someone is actually God, they have to have these inconceivable powers. They have to be able to do things beyond, far beyond any, any, anything which we may think of in the material world. They have to have inconceivable powers. They have to be able to do the, what we think is impossible. Because there are so many people who claim to be God. So it's important to establish that if somebody is actually God, they have these, they have these inconceivable powers and they can, they can actually create it was described even the demigods are bewildered to see the creation, to see the work of creation. Does that help, Maharaji? Yes, thank you so much, Maharaji. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll take a break. Maharaj, I had one question. Yes. Um, in verse 1, uh, like Prabhupada writes in the purport, and we were also discussing that to become a pure devotee of Lord, uh, two things are very much essential. First was namely having a chance to be born in the family of devotee and second was having the blessings of a bona fide spiritual master. So Maharaj, how do we understand the first point as in having a chance to be born in the family of a pure de of a devotee? When we, we have also seen in Shastras that there were devotees in the past whose parents, they were not uh, like, not even devotees. Uh, we see Haridas Thakur. We also see um, many Srila Prabhupada disciples. Their parents necessarily weren't devotees, but yet they are pure devotees. So how do we understand this point, Maharaj? Well, we understand that the blessings of the spiritual master is more important than just simply the seminal birth. The, when we approach the spiritual master, we're given the second birth. The second birth, the spiritual birth. The spiritual birth is more important than the material birth. Well, to be born in a devotee family is certainly an advantage. You may be fortunate, but it's not 100% essential. You have the second birth, you have the contact with the spiritual master. And that is what is very important. Generally, the Shastras will speak about the mercy of the spiritual master. The, there's a Bengali saying, they say that every Janami Janabi Sabi Pita Matapaya Krishna Guru Nahi Mili Bhaja Hari Ai. That everyone has got a mother and father the mata and pita, everyone has got that, the dogs, the birds, the fish, they all have a mother and father. But only the fortunate living entity has got a, a spiritual teacher, a guru, 
And by the grace of the Guru, he, they can get Krishna. And we speak about Brahmanda Brahmite Konyo Bhagavan Jeev, Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lad. By after moving through many universes, when we become fortunate, then we get the seed of devotion from the Guru. So it's a the spiritual master, which the connection with the bona fide spiritual teacher, which is more important than simply the birth in the family of devotees. The birth in the family of devotees can help, it's certainly good in some ways, but it's not 100% essential that if you have the blessings of a spiritual master, and as you say, as you said, there are many devotees, they have, they're, we're not from devotee families, but we have the blessings of the spiritual master, and we've taken shelter of the spiritual master. It's a, that connection with the pure devotee which is more powerful. You can be born in a devotee family, and you can become very attached to the family, you just become attached to the, the mother and father and, and the family and you <laughs> forget about Krishna. So the, the birth in the devotee family is certainly, it can, it can be very good. As Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati and also our Bhaktivedanta Swami, they were both born in devotee families. So certainly there's some advantage there. They're both great souls, and they both had that good birth. But it's not that everyone had that. As you, as you said, there were other people. We you know Narada Muni was the son of a maidservant, but he became a great devotee. Mm. Haridas Thakur, of course, was born in the Mohammedan family. Hmm. Naratam Das Thakur was born in a, ro a royal family. Pralad Maharaj, the son of a demon. Yes, Pralad. And then you have also devotees like Garuda in the bird body, and you have Hanuma in the monkey body, and you know they're great devotees. They didn't even have the human form of life, but they're great devotees. Mm -hmm. Any other examples we can think of? Okay. Any other questions there? Yeah. Thank you for answering, Harish. Thank you. Okay. So we'll take a break for five minutes and we'll come back.
Okay. Hare Krishna. How many people are in the class today? Oh, two. oh, everybody here. Wow. Good. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Let's see. Next slide. Sukadev Goswami's prayers from text 11 up to 25. So Sukadeva Goswami's prayers begin with the glorification of the Lord and then later on then he will ask, he will make his request. Some quotation of Srila Prabhupada from text number 16 of the purport, simple for the simple, attainment of this perfection of life is easily available to a pure devotee of the Lord without his undergoing any difficult method of perfection. Such a devotional life is full of kirtanam, smaranam, ikshanam, etc as mentioned in the previous verse. One must therefore adopt the simple way of devotional life in order to attain the highest perfection available in any category of the human form of life in any part of the world. So sometimes people think, you know, that self-realization must be very difficult. They think you have to undergo great austerities and perform great uh, austerity or give huge amounts of charity or maybe you have to study so much and acquire so much knowledge. But you can see here that Prabhupada is saying that it actually devotional service is simple, a simple way and you can get the highest perfection. Simple in the sense that we simply have to chant, we have to perform in kirtan, doing kirtan and hearing about Krishna, remembering Krishna, all of these things. They're not, not really difficult, but if we do, if we do them in a, with a sincere heart, with the genuine desire that we want to please Krishna, then we can get the highest perfection, far above any kind of perfection which could be achieved by jnana or karma or yoga, just simply by devotion, you can get the highest thing. Prabhupada lecturing here from the first canto, eighth chapter, text number 35. So Prabhupada is describing out of twelve authorities, Sukadeva Goswami is authority. Mahajano Yenagata Sapanta. From the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhyalila. We have to follow the authority. So he says, simply by performing these processes, Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu, then what you are, Lokashyasadyo Vidunoti Kaumasam. This material contamination will be washed off, Lokashyasadya, 
when washed off, immediately sit, immediately, no waking, sadhya. This is Krishna consciousness movement. So Prabhupada is describing to us how effective this process of Krishna consciousness is. That simply if you take up this process, then very quickly you can get rid of the contamination. The material contamination can be removed. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. Other processes, like the process of knowledge, it says, Bahunam Yanmanam Ante Jnanavam Mam Prapajanti. After many births and deaths, when one is actually in knowledge, then he will surrender to Krishna. But if we simply follow the authority, simply follow the example of these great devotees, we can also get the same result as they have achieved. We follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. Right, this verse is from Sinna Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's actually taken from the Mahabharata. There's a verse there in the Mahabharata. But the, the point is, you have to accept authority. So Maharaj Parikshit, he's submitting himself to Sukadeva Goswami. You have to be guided. There has to be some spiritual authority. Just like all of us, we accept a spiritual teacher. We take sh shelter of a spiritual master. We take initiation from him and we go on and take instruction under the spiritual master. We have to follow the authority. Without following the authorities, then we get problems. Yasya Devi para bhakti yata Devi tata guru. We have to have equal faith in both Guru and in Krishna. And then all the purports of the scriptures are revealed. But if we don't follow the authority, if we act independently and whimsically, then we get problems. So Srila Prabhupada is talking about this process, how just simply by practicing this process of hearing and chanting, then all the contamination will be washed off. And this Prabhupada said, immediately, immediately, no waiting. This is Krishna consciousness movement. So we are thinking, oh, it will take so long, I'm so fallen, I'm so conditioned, I'm so covered. But if we follow carefully, it doesn't have to take very long. And we see, we see devotees. We've seen wonderful devotees. We saw, for example, His Holiness Bhakti Charuswami Maharaj. Now Bhakti Charuswami Maharaj, uh, he came to Krishna consciousness. Uh, very quickly, he visited the temple. You know, I, I, I read his book, his biography about his life, and he was describing how he'd, he'd been meeting th some different spiritual teachers and he'd been thinking about what he wanted to get into. But then he met Krishna consciousness. And he met Prabhup he read Prabhupada's Nectar of Devotion and he became convinced. And he, he came to the temple and um, you know, in, within a very short time he became Bhakti Charu Swami. Within a few months practically, Prabhupada made him a sannyasi. And so that that's an example about 
how it happens. And similarly also, then you have Gorbhavinda Swami Maharaj, he came to Prabhupada. Of course, Bhakti Charu was special because he was a young man. Gorbhavinda Maharaj, when he came, he was already somewhat of a retired person. He'd been through family life and he was looking somewhere to devote himself. And Prabhupada immediately accepted him and, and put him in charge, made him a, a sannyasi. So sometimes Prabhupada would do these things within a short time. We see also Jaipataka Swami Maharaj, he, he's been a devotee maybe about two years and he became a sannyasi. And he was still young, very young, he was just like a just 21 or something when he became a sannyasi. Very young man. And so it, these are examples of how people very quickly, they can become uh, advanced in spiritual life. It doesn't have to take any time and they can come from any part of the world also. It's not that it's, oh, you have to be born in a Hindu family or like that. You have to be born in the devotee family. They can come from any part of the world. But if they take it seriously and they, very, they, they become very uh, attentive in hearing and taking up the process are very sincere, then they can achieve the highest perfection. And then the chapter then goes on, text 18, uh, we hear in Prabhupada's purport, it talks about the uh, compassion of devotees. Here you can see a quote from text 18 purport, even those who are constantly engaged in sinful acts are all corrigible to the standard of perfect human beings if they take shelter of the devotees of the Lord. Jesus Christ and Mohammed, two powerful devotees of the Lord, have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord on the surface of the globe. So Srila Prabhupada is talking about the compassion of the devotee, about the pure devotees, how the mercy of the pure devotee is so powerful and so important. And he gives the example of Lord Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad, how they have given shelter to so many devotees. They were devotees and they gave shelter to others and led them on a path to realize God, to come to know God. Of course, you may say so many things, oh, oh they're all meat eaters, oh this and that, you know, they don't follow strictly, but, but still the example is there that Lord Jesus, Prophet Muhammad, that they're teaching about devotion to God. Lord Jesus Christ, he has his, uh, the commandments, to, first commandment, to love God with all thy heart and all thy soul. So that kind of instruction is there. And we see also in uh, the Mohammedan religion, how Prophet Muhammad taught the followers how they have to pray five times a day. So to get people to pray, you know, so many followers, there's so many Christians and so many Muslims, and you know, they, 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 they practice their religion. Maybe the followers of Jesus Christ, they practice to a, a lesser extent than the Muslims. That the Christians generally 
they will go to church on Sunday. But the Muslim people, well, they will go to the mosque. Generally, they go on Friday. Friday is the Sabbath. But that's also changed in some places now, in some parts of the world. In the Middle East, I think, they, they moved it to Sunday. Once a week, they go to the mosque. But they do prayers. They do prayers five times a day. So, I don't know if they all do it, but they're supposed to. And then Christians, they're also supposed to pray to God. So certainly uh, the fact that people have so much faith in these people is very good. People have, the Christians have, very, have great faith in Lord Jesus. They say, Jesus died for the sins. Jesus died for our sins, something we often hear. And so that idea that somebody sacrificed their life for the sins of others, that is compassion. Of course, in our Krishna consciousness movement, we can give the example about Vasudev Datta. And Prabhupada said Vasudev Datta was hundreds and thousands of times more compassionate because his compassion extended to all living entities, not to just humans. So Prabhupada is appreciating the efforts of these two great devotees, that they have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord on the surface of the globe. And so that is very nice appreciation that Prabhupada had so much appreciation for their efforts in promoting consciousness of God. Just getting people to have a religion, to have faith in God, it's a very big thing. Any comments on this? We generally, we, we should always be respectful to other people, to other religious beliefs. Krishna consciousness movement is non-sectarian. Now we accept that the absolute truth is, the highest truth is in our own scriptures, but there's also a lot of truth there in the the Bible and in the Quran. I met one man in Calcutta who was, a, he was teaching English at a university in Calcutta and he was a Muslim and he wrote a book comparing the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran. And he points out how there's so many common points made in both the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita. There's so much similarities between the two books. So like that, we want to be respectful to other traditions. We don't want to deny people that they have their belief. And it's good that they believe in God, they have a religion. Sometimes you meet people like that, they say, oh, I'm a Christian or I'm a Muslim. We can say to them, oh, very good. You believe in God. That's very nice. You know, a lot of people today are just simply atheists. Okay, there's a couple of hands up. Let me see. Uh, Chittahari Prabhu, yes? As you are talking about other religions, uh, I was thinking that actually when Sri Prabhupada used to say often that I have not come here to make convert, I have come here to make Christian a good Christian. Uh, so to make what? I have come here to make Christian a good Christian. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I was feeling that actually the problem in today's world is that people don't follow either Christianity properly. Uh, the 
religion as Prabhupada often quoted that thou shall not kill this is the first instruction first commandment but they don't follow it so if they follow it then the world will become a better place automatically even if they follow that Christian understanding yes uh, Prabhupada did say that you know when we preach to uh, like Christians he said if they cannot accept that you should not eat meat, then he said, don't waste any more time talking to them because you won't get anywhere. And so he said that the important point in presenting our philosophy to the Christian people is that they should not... Huh? Can you hear me? Hare Krishna? Maharaj, you are not audible. Oh, really? What's going on? I don't know. No, it's all right. Is it, it's okay now? Now what is Maharaj? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, there was some problem with the network. Anyway, I was saying Prabhupada, when he met a car, he met one cardinal in Paris, and the cardinal was arguing about eating meat. And Prabhupada didn't talk about anything else. Oh, he only talked about meat eating, that you must stop the meat eating, and that it's wrong to kill. It's wrong to kill, especially the cow. So Prabhupada stressed. Oh. Hare Krishna. ended the broadcast did you get did you did your broadcast also end Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Maharaj. I can hear you Maharaj. what happened Maharaj um, actually the even Dinanath Prabhu and uh, we both, uh, we were both the hosts. So um, I had to change the devices and I was leaving the meeting. So I didn't realize that he had transferred the host to me. Like, so when I left the meeting, the whole meeting ended. So <laughs> disturbance material. World. Okay. So it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Sorry, Maharaj, for interrupting. Sorry, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yes, Mother. Okay, we were talking about this. I was talking about the, the cardinal. Prabhupada was preaching very strongly to this Catholic cardinal about not eating, not killing the cow. But the cardinal would not accept. He was totally against it. He said, no, no, we have to eat meat. So it's sometimes very difficult, yes, to convince them about meat eating. But, you know, sometimes we have, we have to look for some things which we have in common with people. It's, we can always find fault. Here you can see Prabhupada taking a, a very positive approach. He's appreciating the other people that... Uh, he says they've done tr tremendous service on the surface of the globe. Yes, certainly they have huge numbers of followers. And of course, the Hindu religion has the most number of followers. <laughs> but still, uh, Hinduism is very diverse, very, so many different branches of hi Hinduism. And within the Hindu tradition, we have conflicts. All right, we'll go ahead. Here's Prabhupada. 
someone can read for us? The only qualification is that one takes shelter of a pure devotee of the Lord, who has thorough knowledge in the transcendental science. Who has thorough knowledge in the transcendental science of Krishna. Anyone from any part of the world who becomes well conversant in the science of Krishna becomes a pure devotee. And a spiritual master for the gentle mass of people and may reclaim them by purification of heart. Though a person be even the most simple man, he can at once be purified by systematic contact with the pure Vaishnava. Srimad Bhagavatam 2418 Thank you. So, the pure devotee can purify the entire world. One pure devotee, we were speaking in the last class about the, the, the mercy of the devotee is greater than the mercy of Krishna. That the pure devotees, they have that compassion. They want to give Krishna consciousness to everyone. Which and the, Lord Krishna likes to see the devotee get the credit. Of course, the pure devotee doesn't want credit, but he does want to bring people to Krishna consciousness. And they will sacrifice everything for the service of Krishna, to deliver Krishna consciousness to others. And Prabhupada writes here that they may reclaim people from any level of society. It may be the most sinful man. He can at once be purified by systematic contact with a pure Vaishnava. So we see the example of Narada Muni met with Magrari the hunter. And Magra the Magrari the hunter was trapping animals in the most sinful, cruel manner, torturing them and letting them die a slow and painful death. And Narada Muni came to him and by the potency of his preaching, he was able to convince this hunter to give up his killing and to sit and chant the holy name. And then you have Haridas Thakur who delivered a prostitute. The woman came, she wanted to seduce Haridas, but Haridas taught her to chant the holy name. There was one devotee, in, well, one young man in Germany, he became a devotee, and he used to work in the slaughterhouse. He was a butcher in the slaughterhouse, and he became a devotee. And Prabhupada accepted him and initiated him and gave him a beautiful name. So there are many examples, sinful people, how they can be delivered by the mercy of the pure devotee. And we, we hear about people from Africa, you know, sometimes you know, we, we hear that, oh, Africa, it's a land of thieves. Oh, so many thieves are there. Oh, very dangerous place. And you know, But there's so many wonderful devotees there. Some of the devotees are so wonderful. How they chant and dance and how they preach. We, can, we have some sannyasis now from Africa. Very wonderful very powerful in their kirtan and in their preaching, very strongly, very wonderful to see them. Of course, they don't have to be sannyasis. We have some wonderful preachers also. They're grihastas. And they come from these countries, these sinful countries, you know, where people are really in the modes of material nature. The mode of passion, the mode of ignorance is very strong. When, when Srila Prabhupada was telling Tamal Krishna Goswami that he has to go to China, Tamal Krishna Goswami was arguing, he was saying, but Prabhupada, the people there, they eat dogs, they eat snakes, 
He said, how can I go there? The people are so sinful, they eat everything, even snakes. And Prabhupada looked at him and said, you Americans, you eat cows. They are wor you are worse than these people. You, eat, you kill the cow and eat the cow, your own mother. So like that, Prabhupada had that vision, he had that compassion that you can go everywhere and preach Krishna consciousness. And of course Prabhupada arranged like that, he sent the devotees. He sent people like Brahmananda to Africa to preach. He sent Tamal Krishna Goswami to China. He got people to go everywhere. He said, devotees of Krishna are everywhere. They're just waiting for the devotee to come and give them the chance to take up Krishna consciousness. So it's very important statements which are here in the prayers of Sukadeva Goswami. Uh, actually, text 17 is very important, right? You can, somebody could read text number 17? Yes? Read text 17 to me. That's translation or purpose. Yeah, translation. Let me offer my respectful obedience unto the all auspicious Lord Sri Krishna again and again because the great learned sages, the great performers of charity, the great workers of distinctions, the great philosophers of mystics, the great chanters of the Vedic hymns, and the great followers of Vedic hymns, cannot achieve any fruitful result without dedication of such great qualities to the service of Lord. And now read 18. Andra Pulinda Pulaksh Abhira Sumba Yavana. Members of the Kassa races and even others addicted to sinful lives can be purified by taking shelter of the devotees of the Lord due to his being his supreme power. I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto him. So, this is a very important verse, text 18, right? Prabhavishnave Namaha. Prabhavishnave means what? What's the meaning? The powerful Vishnu. Yes, powerful Vishnu. Powerful Vishnu. So by the mercy of the devotee, the Prabha Vishnave Nama, they, they can all be delivered. And Prabhupada talks about Kirita. Kirita Prabhupada said this is the Africans. And Kasha, who is Kasha Desh? Do you know? Kashadesh means? China. China, right. So, Kirita Hanandra Palinda Pukisha Abira Shumba Yavana Kashadaya. Kashadaya, the Chinese and other sinful races. Practically, the entire world is sinful. But they can all be delivered by the mercy of the powerful devotee. So this is the idea, by the mercy of the powerful devotee. All of these people, different places on the planet, different races, they can all be delivered. Very important, powerful preaching. Sukadeva Goswami is describing the power of the devotee. This is one of the important verses in these prayers of Sukadeva Goswami. Okay, someone read. Directly taking shelter of Krishna or to take shelter of a pure devotee who is under the shelter of Krishna, Magashraya. So if one takes shelter of a pure devotee, just like electricity, the powerhouse is far away, but the power is coming. Suppose your body is electrified and if I touch, then my body immediately becomes electrified. Yeah, go on. And if somebody touches me, then others body. This is electric. 
Similarly, one who is pure devotee, he is authorized by Krishna, he is electrified. Lecture, Srimad Bhagavatam, 1, 7, 12, Vrindavan, 1976. So, just like electricity, this is the power of the pure devotee. You, you get association with a pure devotee, you, are, you become changed, you become affected. It is stated, we sing that song every morning about the, the Spirit. My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. Attachment to the lotus feet is a perfection which fulfills all desires. From, a, he, he opens my darkened eyes and fills my heart with transcendental knowledge. From him ecstatic prema emanates, and by him ignorance is destroyed. Right? We're singing this song every morning when we worship Srila Prabhupada. We should meditate on this. We should meditate on the meaning of these songs which we sing. We don't just simply do a ritual every day. You have to know the meaning. We have to enter into that understanding to appreciate the power of the pure devotee, how you can be delivered by the mercy of the devotee. Someone read? Instead of running a godless civilization in the present context of the world situation, if the leadership of world affairs is entrusted, oh. if the leadership of the world affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord for which a worldwide organization and the name and style of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness has already been started, then by the grace of the Almighty Lord there can be a thorough change of heart and human beings all over the world because the devotees of the Lord are able authorities to make such a change but purifying the dust to mind. So Madhiji, I'll ask you a question. I want to know what does Prabhupada mean when he says the the world if the if the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to devotees and then he talks about our own society. Maharaj, I, uh, I took it for myself that if I am in a position of a leader, what Prabhupada expects from me is to uh, follow morning program and what I will follow that only I can preach nicely. So I should uh, first myself become, a, uh, first myself uh, try to follow the instructions of Srila Prabhupada of basic morning sadhana and uh, uh, reading of Srimad Bhagavatam, focusing more on uh, like increasing my philosophical background so that I can stand in that position which Srila Prabhupada is recommending me here. Well, I don't see how this relates to leadership of the world, leadership of world affairs. You know, of course, morning program is very good for your spiritual life, but we're talking about the leadership of world affairs, you know, you think just by going to morning program and doing a good morning program, you're going to become a leader in world affairs? One should have that, uh, should have that ability also to uh, be in a leadership position when we are talking about the world. It is different from what I told Maharaj. I couldn't get this point. What are you saying? Maharaj, I am saying that yes, uh, I could not read this point that leadership of the world affairs. I took it just leadership for and, uh, in a particular response society. But now when you reflect it, when you told, then I re could reflect that it is leadership of the world. So if you are thinking of the leadership of the world, it means that one should have the uh, abilities to uh, have such uh, that in that situation, he can, uh, it is more of the political uh, situation, how it is going. So one has to be uh, in a good standing to fight. Uh, I could little bit. Yes, yes, uh, yes, that's, that's good what you're saying. Yes. I appreciate that point that we should be, 
we should be worthy of that, right? <laughs> Would someone else like to comment on this? How should we understand this? Prabhupada's vision, you could say Prabhupada's mood and mission, that Prabhupada's saying that the worldwide organization under the name and style of ISKCON has already been started. And Prabhupada is saying that we want to have world leaders, leaders of world affairs should be given to the devotees. And he mentions our own society. So how, how can we appreciate, how can we go about furthering this statement of Srila Prabhupada in terms of mood and mission? Any comments? Any ideas? Maharaj, uh, here one of the examples here in Delhi is uh, Prime, uh, Narendra Modi. Like uh, how he is uh, encouraged by His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. So uh, how Maharaj sees a visionary leader in him is encouraging. So Prabhupada is basically talking about the leadership of the world. So. Uh, so that the Krishna consciousness movement can be spread throughout the world because when there is a political, when there is a society which is governed, uh, which has a government, it, if the government takes it, it is very easy for the followers to follow it. So proper uh, basically wants uh, the leaders, uh, the devotees should be in that position of guiding the whole world. Yes. Uh, and, and we see just recently, you know, they elected, you know, a, a Hindu man as Prime Minister of England, Rishi Sanak, became the Prime Minister of England, of the UK. And after he was made the Prime Minister the next morning, he came to Bhaktivedanta Manor to offer prayers and to beg empowerment for his duty as the Prime Minister. And so we can see somehow that these things are they're gradually coming to life, but you can see it there in the UK. And now you mentioned now... Also Gosh, we cannot hear your voice. Yeah, the internet is unstable here. Can you hear me now? Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you now. The internet is unstable, unfortunately. I was saying like, Narendra Modi also is an example. You gave him as an example that he has also good relationship with our devotees. Although he's not, of course, fully is gone, but he's still he's very favorable and highly appreciative of the effort. We hope that as time goes on, devotees can become more and more influential. We saw how uh, Radhanath Maharaj was able to enter into the parliament, the House of Parliament in the UK and talk about his own experiences and his book, The Spiritual Journey. So gradually more and more things are developing in that way and we hope that in the future that some of the leaders, those people in leadership positions who are in politics, that we can also bring them into Krishna consciousness. We can encourage them also in Krishna consciousness. Or maybe some of our own devotees will enter into politics. It certainly happens in course of... We have also the lady, uh, what was her name, the, the woman in America who in, based in Hawaii, she's uh, oh, Gubbard, right? Tulsi Gubbard. Yeah, Tulsi Gubbard, Tulsi Gubbard, that she's a devotee and she was preaching the message of Bhagavad Gita and coming to Rathiatra and seeing Hare Krishna, but she's a very prominent politician in the USA. So gradually these things are happening. The world affairs, devotees are taking more and more role in these things. And it, it's not Maya. <laughs> we, we, we would like to see the world become more Krishna conscious by these devotees. 
All right. Any comments? We'll go ahead. All right. Someone read the next quote. Guiding human society. Someone can read. The politicians of the world may remain in their respective positions because the pure devotees of the Lord are not interested in political leadership or diplomatic implications. The devotees are interested only in seeing that the people in general are not misguided by political propaganda and in seeing that the valuable life of human being is not spoiled in following a type of civilization which is ultimately doomed. If the politicians, therefore, would be guided by the good counsel of the devotees, then certainly there would be a great change in the world situation by the purifying propaganda of the devotees as shown by Lord Chaitanya. Srimad Bhagavatam 2418 Bhagavad Shabrabhad Ki Jai. So, what is Prabhupada saying here? Madhichi. The Prabhupada is telling to uh, the politicians to take good counsel from the devotees. Yes, they have to be guided by the devotees. The brahmanas are not interested in power, but they can give advice. We're meant to be like the brahmana, the, 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 the devotees. We're meant to guide people, give them spiritual advice. The politicians, they're more kshatriyas. Their nature is more kshatriya, so they have to lead. They have to guide, but it's the brahmanas who will give the advice, the instructions, what they need to do to the, improve the standard of human living, to improve the, the, the culture and the proper use of the human life, that it should not be wasted. So we're meant to give that kind of spiritual guidance as well as material guidance. So Prabhupada talks about the good counsel of the devotees, then there can be a change in the world situation. So devotees have to be able to give that kind of guidance, that kind of good counsel. And we see some, some devotees, some parts of the world, it, it, it happens. When Bhakti Tirtha Swami was there in Africa, he was meeting with political leaders in Africa. They were highly respectful and they gave him a lot of uh, time to speak and they would hear him. So that, that's one example. We have also in the UK, one example, one devotee is there, he's working with the very prominent politicians, he meets them regularly, guides them. Just like Lord Chaitanya was guiding Maharaj Pratiparudra. Oh, okay, so let's see. Are there any questions on this? Before, because it, the next slide, that's on the fifth chapter. We've pretty much gone through the main points of the fourth chapter. We spoke about Maharaj Parikshit and his desire to hear about Shristi Tattva. Maharaj Parikshit wanted to hear about Shristi Tattva to understand more of the inconceivable potency of the Lord because the whole process of creation was bewildering even to the demigods. So Sukadeva Goswami begins to describe the process of creation, but before entering into descriptions of the creation, he first of all offers prayers. And we've been hearing particularly that one prayer, which is very famous among all the prayers of Sukadeva Goswami, that one verse is very well known, often quoted, Describing the different sinful races, Kirita, Hanandra, Palinda, Pukasha, 
अबीर शुंब यवन कश दाया यन ये च पापा यद पश्रय श्रया सुजंति तस्माय प्रभ विष्णवे नमः सो प्रभ विष्णवे पावरफुल विष्णु द डिवोटी ऑफ द लॉर्ड इज द रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ लॉर्ड विष्णु एंड इफ द डिवोटी इज पावरफुल देन ही कैन डिलीवर ऑल ऑफ दिस डिफरेंट सिंफुल रेसिस so anyone from any part of the world in any species of life they can be delivered by the mercy of the devotees the mercy of the lord is greater than the mercy of krishna and we want to encourage the devotees therefore to go everywhere and to preach prabhupada always like to hear about devotees going to new places to open up new fields of preaching one of the things which prabhupad did just before he departed one of the devotees had gone to bangladesh distributing books for the bhakti vidanta book trust and after they distributed books around india to the colleges and libraries then the idea came why don't we go to bangladesh and nepal and thailand and these places in burma and distribute the books there and so the devotees went and the one devotee who went to bangladesh then he was he, he found the people to be so receptive and so nice and he could understand it was a prime field for preaching just like when prabhupad went to russia Prabhupada went to Russia and he met the one Russian boy and that one Russian boy was so interested and so receptive Prabhupada gave the example just like when you cook rice you take one grain of rice and if that one grain of rice is cooked then you know all the rice is cooked so Prabhupada could under, when he heard about the devotee's experience in going to Bangladesh Prabhupada immediately encouraged the devotee that you must go there and Prabhupada was they said well there's no money there Prabhupada there's not we won't be, how will we ever preach there we don't have any money they don't have any money there they cannot support us and Prabhupada said I will give the money and Prabhupada gave money from his own from his own bank from his own uh, uh, he had like MBT Mayapur Vrindavan Trust he said every month you must give money for preaching in bangladesh and nepal and this went on for some years that the devotees would get money every month even after prabhupada departed they were getting money from the mvt to for the preaching in bangladesh and in nepal of course eventually the preaching became so established there that there was no need to get money from the mvt that they could maintain themselves but that was prabhupada's mood but the prophet made that sacrifice in the beginning to get the preaching going he liked devotees to go to these different places and open up the field of preaching all right are there any questions any comments so we spoke about jesus christ and prophet muhammad that they made also a great contribution to the world helping people to have faith in god of course you can say well they don't follow they don't follow very the the and the the the, the message the quran chankazi also told lord chaitanya that the people the the they they have changed the meaning of the scriptures they're not following strictly the meaning of the quran the chankazi admitted that to lord chaitanya mahaprabhu 500 years ago and similarly also in christianity there's so many different versions different interpretation but nevertheless somehow people have faith in god they have faith in some kind of religion and that that in itself is good they're not atheists and then we also spoke about leadership that devotees can also take leadership positions that the one the devotee of the lord could also become leader in world affairs that would be very good for the whole human civilization because they can guide people in taking proper uh 
proper knowledge, proper education. All right. Any any comment, a question, anything? All right. Then, if there's nothing, then we will finish here today, and we'll have class. Yes. I have a question, Maharaj. Okay. I raised my hand. Maharaj, I wanted to ask that uh, regarding the uh, interfaith, like uh, when we have interfaith dialogues, like between uh, people of different faith, like when we go to attend these programs, or sometimes when we are uh, when some of our friends, we respect their religion, but they call us to their uh, parties, like their uh, their sanghas. So, Maharaj, how to avoid that? Because respecting is one thing and attending is another thing. So, like, re if we respect, they call call us. So, how do we respond to these uh, things? And second, like, um, I've seen, like, many devotees who have, like, parents who are Christians, they are still... Uh, uh, giving so much love and concern to them. So, uh, Maharaj, I feel like how how do they do it? Because like uh, they are inside a strong Vaishnavas, but they have to deal with the society like that. So, Maharaj, if you can some uh, put some light on these two things. Well, of course, we're not going to compromise on our own standards. We have our standard. We can say, yeah, well, all right, you have your faith, I can respect it, but I have my standards, you know, we have our own particular standards. You have to simply explain to them that I, I, we have our own standards, we have our own diet, we have our own lifestyle, and we can't expect it's going to be exactly the same as all these other people. And we're not expected to compromise on our standards just for the sake of them. But, if they are understanding and reasonable people, they will appreciate that you're doing something, you have your own life, you have your own, your own way of doing things. Just as we respect them, you know, they should also respect us. They should also appreciate our beliefs and our standards. And so, you may, be, you may be coming from a Christian family, Christian family, so, okay, they believe in God, so, you know, what's the problem, you know, we believe in God, we're not rejecting Christianity, Jesus said, love God, we're learning how to love God. One of the devotees used to say, if Jesus Christ was to come down today, he would be in the Hare Krishna movement, if he was going to actually come to come in this world today, he would join our movement because he could see that we're the ones who are actually teaching love of God, teaching people how to love and serve God joyfully. You get you get people that you know if if their son or daughter is going drinking and taking drugs and doing all kinds of immoral things, they don't mind about it. They think, oh well, they're just young. But as soon as they become Hare Krishna, oh, he's a fanatic, or she's a fanatic, uh, you know. Sometimes people are quite unreasonable about these things. So you have to have, you have to have belief yourself, you have to be convinced that what you're doing is right. And you can't always expect that your parents or your family members will be able to understand or appreciate what you're doing. But what to do about it? If you know what you're doing, if you believe in what you're doing, you're convinced about it, you do it. They may not like it, but gradually they'll come to accept it. Prabhupada said in the beginning they will laugh, and then after some time they'll hate us. Then they will join us. So it's like that. You have to be patient, you have to except there's going to be some difficulties for some time. But gradually, if they see that you're really convinced that your life is better and you're happier, then they will appreciate. You understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. All right, so we have class tomorrow. 
to finish this unit and then you have to have your exam next week. That will be on the Friday, I think, your exam. Yes, and then on the Saturday, then we'll begin the next unit. Okay? So we'll meet you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yes, Hare, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki. Oh, yeah.